Perched on what is enviably the best vantage point that Durban has to offer, enjoying sweeping views that stretch from the northernmost hutments of the indigenous Zulu people, watching over the exotic green cultivated fields of the almost artificial sugarcane, the world famous shoreline, the port settlement and the rapidly developing southern suburbs is a piece of real estate as visionary as its founder. The establishment of Ohlange remains today a citadel that pioneered and pursued the century-old pathway for South Africa's people to claim their birthright. This is the place that brought out the sweat of dignity from a people smothered into the dust of their own land. The same land that nurtured them out of wearing splinters into a united front that could finally conquer oppression. This is the land that harnessed the rapid changes of fate, reigning in a beleaguered, bewildered people to a spirited charge to victory. This is the land of John Dube. As the first president of the ANC, as a person who was well read, as a person who was a publisher, as a person who was a pastor or a priest, he had his hands in many facets of life and uh, he was dynamic. He was uh, industrious, uh, he, he had a great vision for a new society. He was one of those people that was bold enough uh, to take an initiative. He was the kind of person who uh, existed probably before his time. And the ideas that he held uh, dear then are still um, being uh, practiced even today. John Langalibalele Dube was born in 1871 of a royal Zulu lineage in the Inanda district of KwaZulu-Natal in the northwest outskirts of Durban. His father, Reverend James Dube, was one of the first ordained pastors of the American Zulu mission and his grandmother, through the American missionary Daniel Lindley, was one of the first Zulus to embrace Christianity. Their arrival in places like Inanda uh, did mark a new beginning in the way in which people saw life. Uh, it did usher in a new era. Uh, people got to understand um, other ways of looking at the world uh, through the introduction of Christianity, for example, and started to reorganize themselves and form themselves in a different way. We are born again down. Yalla. Kwa wind down, ya bantu ni. Unanda nje yom. Kwa wa bantu ni, abantu, ababeng, abani, ababeng aku. Missionaries were very honest about development, honest about uh, education, and the, some of them refused to be used as an oppression tool um, and allowed the free spirit from those who were oppressed to emerge and to begin to realize their potential. They brought their Western culture and democratic principles. We learned something from them, and I think they also learned something from, from the Zulu culture. That is why today we are having Shembe Church, where we still practice our Zulu, our Zulu culture. <laughs> I will say the missionaries contributed positively because we are where we are today because of Wilcox and, and his family. Dube was educated in Inanda and later at Adams College in Amanzimtoti. Thus, he was influenced by the American Zulu mission in Natal. While being a student at Amanzimtoti in the 1880s, the new head of the school, missionary H.D. Goodenough, introduced industrial education as per government regulations. From 1884 to 1885, a hall was built by the pupils themselves and an industrial department was established. 
Jubilee Hall began to play an increasingly important role in the life of the school, but more importantly, in the mind of Dube. By the time Dube left for America for the first time, printing, shoemaking, blacksmithing, beekeeping, bricklaying, bookkeeping, bookbinding, and cartography were being taught at Adams College in Amanzim Doti. As James Dube wanted his son to follow in his footsteps and become a priest, John Dube, at the tender age of 17, accompanied the missionary W.C. Wilcox and his family to the United States. There he studied at the Oberlin College while supporting himself in a variety of jobs. Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee and Dubes Oberlin College experience sowed the seeds in his mind for the establishment of an industrial institute in Natal. J.L. Dube went abroad with the Wilcox family and he was exposed to this uh, Western culture and principles. He saw the tremendous work of Booker T. Washington um, in America, who promoted the idea of self-reliance against the backdrop of slavery. He was fortunate and opportune to have studied and uh, identified some of the black leaders at the time in the likes of uh, Booker T. Washington, uh, W. Du Bois, who had already formed an, uh, an educational institution, Tuskegee College, where emphasis were put on self-determination and uh, you know it was more of a, a self-help approach that that school adopted in the US and my grandfather having been opportune to travel as far as uh, Alabama in the United States he saw a real need for him you know to come back home and start his own personal you know, um, school for the benefit of the black youth in South Africa. My dear Dr. Washington, I am received of your letter and I was glad to hear from you for your devoted life in the interest of the Negro race has made me love you dearly. On his second I'm visit to the United States, he garnered more experience and further training. And with the idea of an industrial school lingering in his mind, he began collecting money for the establishment of his Zulu industrial school to promote Zulu culture, self-reliance and unison amongst Africans. To him, education was not about pieces of paper and certificates. He envisioned education meaning to mean the development of your mind with the right heart, which we are to call, today we call the attitude, and with your hands being able to produce. It is a scatter we are pressure. I was born on my opportunity. I'm a new pressure. We say born good to eh. Now, if you na wa wa u principal wa na po kloso school na fundakson. Kwa ku pan. In kuto di kamalak. Bukati Washington. Owa na ye. Owa ye tanda ban pa. In 1900, on 200 acres of land in the Inanda district, he founded the Zulu Christian Industrial School, Oshange. Dube wanted Oshange to prepare pupils to be skilled laborers. Their newly developed skills came with some trepidation from the government over the prospect of what they might choose to accomplish. Dube's creation of one of the first schools of higher learning for the indigenous people in Africa marked a crucial turning point in the history of Otlange. When I, I look at, at uh, John Dube, uh, his writings are all about how we create educated people focused on economic empowerment who are also themselves making sure that there's a moral integrity, uh, an African humanism. Uh, that is basic to their core. Uh, Oshlange was started to, one, inspire confidence in uh, the, the black child and uh, to make sure that the black child has the skills uh, that they need to be able to succeed in life. He managed to, to emerge you know, as a victor and the first black to start a first black educational institution 
not only to benefit his family, but he thought of a black child out there to say, let me open this up for the benefit of the entire black society. He was a firm believer in racial equality among the demoralized African people. He desired to elevate their lives to ideals more lofty and realized equality and justice for all. Whilst abroad, he had also worked as a journalist for a publication called The Missionary Review of the World. This prompted Dube to reach out to his people via the media and in 1903, he established the first Isuzulu newspaper in the country. Ilangalase Natal, or the son of Natal, which he used to stress the need for African unity and to air more specific grievances affecting his people. His founding of Ilanga, Lase Natali, which is still in print up to this day, was an achievement. Dube wanted an alternative um, uh, platform for him to be able to express his views unedited. And people really read most of the, their leaders' thoughts and opinions to the paper. Um, he understood that um, the media allows you to reach out to many more people than a single meeting or a rally could ever do. When he returned home from the United States in 1905, after his third visit, there were overt signs of tension between him and other white missionaries. John Dube was witness to the racism within Christianity and this became a turning point for him to support his people. Ilangala Senatali assailed the exploitation of the African people and land distribution policies of the missionaries. With the ideals of emancipation fueling his drive, he resigned from the pastorate of Inanda. John Langlade Dube got involved into politics because despite um, living in many worlds, as in being a, a, a pastor, uh, being an educationist, being an editor, I think he realized that he cannot be able, number one, to realize his full potential of all his gifts and talents uh, against the backdrop of uh, oppression. My grandfather, then that was the point when he was motivated to say, I need to create you know, some kind of a structure or an instrument that was going to make them to speak in one voice to fight against the unjust system of the, of the oppression at that time. He protested and petitioned the government's proposed legislations through columns of Ilanga. He also vehemently opposed the arrest and the trial of King Dinizulu in connection with the 1906 Bambata rebellion and publicized these events. As a result, the government attempted to suppress the newspaper before and during the rebellion and it thus became the object of incessant scrutiny and suspicion. In the violent times of the Anglo-Boer War, he was detained for alleged subversive statements he had made against the government. Driven by courage and passion, he and several others formed the Natal Native Congress and utilized it to express and foster African feelings and brought African grievances to the attention of the government. John Dube fought for equality, equality between blacks and whites. He fought for freedom, freedom from oppression, freedom from a system that relegated uh, Africans as second-class citizens in their own country. Well, 
Well, he fought for the rights of the people. He wanted people to, to have a clear understanding of their own identity. He was an ordained priest, but he still instilled the culture of, you know, understanding the cultural values amongst his people. Dube was elected as the first president of the Natal Native Congress, later called the African National Congress, in 1912. During his presidency, he continued to spread the message that African people must do things for themselves. The black leadership then believed that he was the, the right person to lead uh, our emancipation from apartheid. The historic relationship between Dube Gandhi and Shembe is signified by their broadly similar outlook on life. Stories of extraordinary deeds of the three leaders sent ripples of awe across the globe. Theirs was a vision that saw beyond differences in color, caste or creed. They enjoyed a position that the white rulers could only envy. Inspired by simple living and self-help, they nurtured the fight against oppression in parallel thus mobilizing and unifying communities to foster the freedom of African people. Mm. During the same period, down the hill, Mahatma Gandhi started uh, the Indian Opinion newspaper, which was later called the Opinion, during the same year. So they were quite, uh, you know, uh, competent at that time. And uh, this issue of disseminating information uh, they both saw it fit at the time to say this is one way for us to be able to conscientize the local people to stage you know various uh, social and political campaigns so that our people can be aware and begin to understand some of the things that were hidden and some of the things that were not supposed to have been you know known by our people at that time. Dr. John Dubé is a good example of a person who realized the importance, firstly, of education, of saying that we've got to have an, a, a, a system of much more universal education going there. So if you look at a lot of, a lot of what he did, whether it was a Hlangi as an institution, whether it was a Langa as the newspaper, all of those were firstly saying that we need to make sure that we're broadening the base of educated people, people who understand the bigger world. John Dube clearly demonstrated to the world that it is not true to conclude that the African is incompetent as far as achievement is concerned. His teachings and beliefs have shaped the prosperity and the future of Ohlange High School. Set against a period of oppression, Ohlange managed to produce self-reliant and willing individuals who have made their mark in the South African landscape, becoming beacons of John Dube's aspirations in a democratic South Africa. The, the mission is saying we want to provide meaningful education to, 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 to make responsible citizens that can fit in in the social economic system of the 21st century. And also looking at the history of the school, there are prominent leaders who went through the institution. I think uh, those leaders are inspiring, uh, inspiring to the young, young learners, the upcoming. Uh, upcoming learners. It continued to produce, you know, uh, heroes and heroines, you know, who today, you know, apply their professional traits, you know, in, in, in various fields, you know, in, in government, you have people that uh, today are quite prominent because they were shaped, you know, and molded by uh, Otlanga Institute. I think the success of Otlanga High School was shaped from inception. You know, Dube being the strong leader, I remember he was the first principal again here in the school. That he created um, a special affinity um, for his people, pupils uh, with the school. He taught them things uh, that they will never learn in any other school. You know, Otlang is special.
Today, Osha Ange enjoys another chapter as host to national and international dignitaries, continuing and expanding the legacy of John Dube through the publications and rich history that best describe Osha Ange. The voting at Inanda of the former president, the first president of the Democratic Republic of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, was an important statement in terms of paying homage to the works and the legacy of the first leader of his party, the ANC. Matiba couldn't have voted anywhere else. Uh, that's where I'll start with this one. Um, for his first vote, because remember his first vote, first vote was very important to him. And he needed to make a mark. And he needed to make a statement with his first vote. Some people don't know that when Madiba voted, one of the words he said was that, Mr. President, the freedom that you fought for has arrived. And that was the reason why you voted in Northern. When Dr. Nelson Mandela came in, the, in this institution, that was a symbol of respect. He came to the school, he went to the gravesite, he reported to the first president of the ANC that, uh, President, I'm here to report that the country is now free. I think it was a gesture of respecting Dr. Jen Dewey. 